name is Marcia Sanborn, and I'm here from the International Dyslexia Association with the Inland Empire Branch. Uh, we're based out of Riverside, California, uh, and it's just a pleasure to be here with you guys today. And I learned a lot of really interesting things in, in all the other sessions, so I hope you will do the same for this one. Um, a lot of people don't, you know, people are familiar with the term dyslexia, but they don't really know what it is. They think that it is an umbrella term, kind of a catch-all phrase, and that's, it really it has a very specific definition for it and a very specific remediation for it. And so we're going to go through today um, what dyslexia is. This is what we're going to look at. <clears throat> We're going to find out, well, how much do you really know about dyslexia? What is it? Um, a lot of people, I was a second grade teacher and a high school teacher, I didn't have a clue what dyslexia was. Um, we're going to look at the definition of dyslexia from the National Institutes of Health and the International Dyslexia so um, Society. We're going to take a look, well, what does dyslexia look like? When someone hands you a piece of paper, or turns in homework, or turns in some work that they've done, what does dyslexia look like on paper? How can you recognize it? And lastly, what is some of the recommended treatment for someone with dyslexia? OK, I suspect someone might have dyslexia. Now, what do I do about it? OK? Um, actually, I do. I have a fifth one up here also. We're just going to talk a little bit about some diagnostic considerations. Do you have to be diagnosed? Well, no, of course not. Um, but we're just going to talk about some of the things to consider if someone is seeking a diagnosis. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to start off with a story. It's by uh, Why Our Children Can't Read and What We Can Do About It by Diane McGinnis. And uh, kids, when they start off reading, they either... They, it, Problems come up one of two different ways, and this is the first way that problems are seen um, in a youngster. If you want to follow along with me, the Jamesons were a model middle-class family. Jim and Pat were devoted parents to their three children, umpiring for Little League, running carpools to diving lessons, dancing lessons, and soccer practice. They valued learning and read bedtime stories every night. They valued education. <laughs> Their youngest son, Donnie, started kindergarten after two years at a well-run preschool. Donnie could recite the alphabet, write most of his letters, and count to 2,000 if anyone would let him. In kindergarten and first grade, Donnie taught himself to read several simple books. He got an A on his report card for language arts. His teacher said he was the best reader in the whole class. Okay, so it looks like Donnie is off to a pretty good start. Uh, on the next slide, he's going to start second grade, and problems are going to start occurring. Why is he so successful in kindergarten and first grade, and why are there problems that are coming up in second grade? Any thoughts? Yes. Memorizing. He's memorizing. Very good. <laughs> in second grade, the words got longer. Donnie had trouble remembering all of them. He began to ask his friend, what does this word say? He would try to memorize it for the next time he saw it in a story. As the year went by, he had to ask his friends more and more often. And this is uh, the problem that comes in. In second grade, we are required to know about 211,000 words. That's a lot. That's going to start really taxing your mental energy if you have to memorize all those words. But you might be able to get through with second grade, OK, especially when you have pictures in your books to give you the content clues. But in fifth grade, it jumps exponentially up to over a million words that you're responsible to be able to decode and comprehend. And in 10th grade, then it's 2.3 million. So there you see, that's where his problem is. He could memorize it to get through first grade, but then the breakdown started. In third grade, the words got longer still. The books had more pages, and uh, he, he can't understand the story. Uh, the parents spent time listening to Donnie read and correcting his mistakes as they went along. Research shows if you are sitting side by side with a child and just correcting their mistakes as they go along, you're, you will not see long-term gain. Um, and, and that's what I did as a second grade teacher. I just sat next to them and, and went around. And we're going to talk about why that is when we talk about the definition of dyslexia. Um, so now Donnie has extra tutoring and his reading is still not improving. How many of you have worked and worked and worked with the child and you haven't seen reading improve? I know I have. <laughs> um, also, Donnie could memorize the weak spelling words long enough to pass a test but then he forgets them a week later. 
And that's a real common symptom with dyslexia. Um, Donnie is now a year and a half behind in reading, two years behind in spelling, yet he had an IQ of 124. This is a very bright little boy. Boy, but he's not reading and spelling it. Uh, one thing I want you to hear, dyslexia has nothing to do with intelligence. I don't know if you guys are aware of that, but it has nothing to do. The two do not correlate at all. Uh, Albert Einstein, he was dyslexic. Leonardo da Vinci, some of your brightest people, uh, but yet they have difficulty in reading and writing. And that's part of the nature of the beast. You can be very bright. Most people think, if I can't read, if I can't spell, I must be dumb. Not true. The parents found a tutor in the yellow pages, and the cost was $80. I don't know how much they charge out here in California. I'm from the Midwest. We only charge like $25. But someone told me that it was like, like this out here. I'm like, wow, I need to start tutoring out here. Um, the person was kind and patient, but knew as much about how to remediate reading problems as Pat and Jim. The tutor merely listened to Donnie, the same as his mom had done, and corrected his mistakes. Um, this is one, um, one of my favorite reading researchers is Dr. Reed Lyon from the National Institutes of Health, and he says the psychological, social, economic consequences of reading failure are legion. If you do not learn to read and you live in America, you do not make it in life. And how true and how sad is that? I find it very interesting that all this research that is being done, it's actually not done through the Department of Education. I mean, isn't that where you think that it would come from? It comes from the National Institutes of Health. They consider illiteracy a health issue. Um, and I found that very, very interesting. Uh, also, according to the National Institutes of Health, what percentage of fourth graders cannot read at grade level? Any, any ideas? Throw, so, throw some numbers out. 20%, 30%, 50%, 70%. And in some of the inner city schools, absolutely. If you combine all the schools together, the um, research has shown 38% of fourth graders cannot read on grade level. Yes, and that's national. That's the fluent communities, that is the, the poverty communities. Okay, that, that is the average. If you think about the billions and billions of dollars we spend on education, and we have that many who are not reading at grade level, we're not saying who are good readers. We're saying they don't even meet the minimum standards for their grade level. So um, they don't even reach, you know, if it's a 20% that they have to get to pass the test, they're not even reaching that, that bottom bar that they need to get to. Um, this was also by um, Reed Lyon. He says... This is very interesting to note. Um, students who fall behind in reading and writing do not catch up unless, or become fluent readers unless given intensive, systematic, and expert help. You want to be aware, a lot of parents, they say, well, my teacher or my, my son or daughter's teacher told me that my child's problem was it was just a, any ideas? A phase, exactly, a developmental lag. They're just a little bit behind. There's no need to worry. They're just a little bit behind. Research shows 74% of those who are behind in reading in third grade are behind in reading in ninth grade. It's, uh, this reading disability, it is a, a persistent um, deficit. It is not a developmental thing. It's a persistent uh, development and those who are 74% who are behind in third grade will also be behind in ninth grade. So now that you're all depressed, okay, let's give um, a little bit of hope here. National Institutes of Child Health and Development studies show that 90 to 95% of reading impaired children can overcome their difficulties if they receive appropriate treatment from an early age. You, they can. Um, I ran a learning center for dyslexic kids, and they, it was amazing. They did fantastic when they, were, when they received appropriate treatment from an early age. Early identification is so very important. Okay, so now let's go ahead and take a look at your sheets and find out what you know about dyslexia. Okay, number one. 
true or false? You guys can just shout it out or um, tell us what you think it is. Dyslexia is a reading disability. False. Oh, you guys are good. Everybody always gets that one wrong. What is it? Thank you. It's a language disability. It affects all aspects of language, your verbal expression, your written expression, your reading, including your decoding, your fluency, your comprehension, your spelling, your foreign language, even your social, uh, picking up other social cues. Um, it affects all of that. So, but everyone thinks that it is a reading disability. But one of the reasons for that, uh, this is Fortune Magazine, the dyslexic CEO. Um, in here, when you read it, they call it a reading disability. Um, what exactly is dyslexia? The everyman definition calls it a reading disorder. That's not what it is. Same here, it was on the cover of Time Magazine. Overcoming dyslexia, they call it a reading disorder. It is so much more than a reading disorder. It affects so many more things uh, than just your reading. So we have a lot of false information out there. Every time I see that, I, I cringe. Um, number two, the most telling sign of dyslexia is in one spelling. Is that true or false? True. Oh, about 50-50. It is absolutely true. A dyslexic person's spelling is going to be the number one red flag to you that indicates dyslexia. They can actually, this is going to, I'm jumping ahead a little here, they can actually, some of these kids can read at grade level. When I ran the Dyslexia Learning Center, uh, we had kids coming in, and at first I was new into this whole field, and it freaked me out because the kids were reading. And I was like, oh no, you know, what do I do? How can I help them? They're already reading. Well, and, and some of them were reading at grade level. But the tell, and we're going to talk more about that again when we talk about the definition of dyslexia. Um, but yes, the telltale sign is in the spelling. How many times has a student seen the wood should, your average fourth grade student? S-H-O-U-L-D. And they go to write it, they can't spell it. They've seen it over and over and over and over and over and over and over. They go to spell it. I've had eighth graders, I've had 12th graders who can't spell the word should. Um, and yet their IQ is above average. And why is that? Because they are dyslexic. Um, number three, uh, screening for potential reading problems can be accurately identified before a child begins kindergarten. Is that true or false? True. It is true. It is true. You can red flag these kids. You wouldn't want to diagnose them with dyslexia, of course. That would be a little premature. But you can red flag kids who have high potential with extremely high accuracy. Pre-K. Well, you're like, well, how can you do that if they can't read yet? Dyslexia is a deficit in the phonological processing. So what you would do to a kid who's three or four, I work on some of this with my son, I say, say ham. What rhymes with ham? And he says, yeah, well, I might not want to use that one but um, for my three-year-old son. But, you know, rhyming. Um, if I say ham, now say it without the huh. um, Can he just say am? Okay, I mean, that, that, those, that's just a top circuit. That's the core deficit in kids who are going to develop dyslexia. And you can test that pre-K. So why don't we, um, for the most part of schools in this country, pre-test kids pre-K? Why don't we do that? Budget. Budget, but actually, I'm going to have to say that that's a good, a good suggestion. However, to remediate costs you 100 times more than it would be to do preventative work with these kids. 100 times more to remediate over prevention. Who do you think would be the most against testing these pre-kindergartners? Mom and dad. You're going to test my kid. Now, he, he's only four, and you're going to test him. Um, you haven't even given him a chance yet. He's only four, and he, he's just learning his alphabet. And you're telling me that my child in fourth grade will have problems reading? And then they're like, and then you label him. So parents are very opposed to different school districts in the country who have tried to screen early because you can get in there and intervene, but you have to have the kids identified ahead of time. And you, um, you intervene. Um, a couple of the, the screening tools are 
the CTOP, the Comprehensive Test of Phonological, Pro um, Phonological Processing, the Lindsay Mood um, Auditory Conceptualization Test. Uh, there, there's, there's hundreds out there. Um, there's even some, these are nationally normed tests, but there's also ones you can just pull off the computer. Um, okay, the next one, number four. If a student can read at grade level, he cannot be dyslexic. False. False. Very good. You guys are paying attention. <laughs> so yes, you can read at grade. Some of these kids can read at grade level. The thing that makes them dyslexic, let's say like Donnie, they had an IQ of, um, I forgot exactly what he had, maybe 120 I think it was. So his IQ is up here, um, and he's reading here. Now say this is the third grade. This is normal for third grade. You want to hit right here. Well, he's hitting there. The problem is, because of his high IQ, he should be up here. He should be higher than what he is because of his IQ. He should be reading. If he's going to read in congruence with his IQ, he should be reading at a seventh grade level. Um, Number five, dyslexia affects 80% of those identified with learning disabilities. True. True. Dyslexia is the most widespread out of uh, any of the learning disabilities. It gets very gray and very hard to tell what is dyslexia and what isn't because it has such a high comorbidity with ADHD, with dysgraphia, with dyscalculia, dysnomia. It, it just spills into everything because it is a language deficit, not a reading deficit. So it's going to spill into all those other areas um, and cause a lot of problems. Uh, ten, it depends where you read this. Different research says a little bit different things, but in general, they say 10 to 22 percent of the general population is dyslexic. So that's pretty high. I've seen as low as 5 percent, and I've seen as high as 25 percent. So in there. Number six, dyslexia results from deficiencies in the visual perceptual system. The student perceives letters and words backwards or inaccurately. <laughs> that is the biggest misconception about dyslexia. And why do we think it? Things like this. Things like this. B and D reversals. Um, there is actually, in these students with dyslexia, there is no deficit in visual processing. Zero. They've done, I know, that blew my mind when I heard that. I'm like, that can't be. I see students who reverse B's and D's. They've done research after research after research, and they prove it over and over again. If any of you have read, it's also in, um, it was just updated in Shelley Shaywitz's book, Overcoming Dyslexia. She cites the research in there. Um, if we have time at the end, I, I can tell you it, but I'm going to keep going right now. But remind me if you want to know how they prove that at the end. And if I have time, I'll hit that. Um, number seven, a sound and intensive phonics program is sufficient to get one reading at his or her reading ability level. False. False. Phonics is a good thing, so don't hear, misunderstand me there. You want phonics. Uh, phonics is necessary, but in and of itself, it is not sufficient. It's not going to get these kids to go where they need to go. A lot of these dyslexic kids are bright kids. They should be going to, uh, you know, doing well in, in an honor roll and going to, to college and grad school and medical school, um, and, they, and they don't. And so um, we need to give them something that's so much deeper than phonics. That A says, ah. <laughs> um, they need much more than that to get you know, into the Greek and the Latin words that they're going to come across when they're, when they're older. Last one, number, well, it should say number eight there. Over 85% of the English language is predictable or decodable if you know rules that govern the language. True, true. Wow, you guys are good. Everyone always like, no. <laughs> Actually, what, what it is, it's 87%. 87%, and you know, I have all my textbooks, um, that, that, and all the research that shows it, the research is there. 87% of the English language is predictable, if you know the rules that govern the English language. Do you want me to explain that real quickly? You guys curious about that? Because all of us were like, yeah, but English is so irregular. That's what makes it so difficult. 
Well, there are 600,000 words in the Oxford Dictionary. English words. Here, our, our language comes from three main places. It comes from the Greek, it comes from the Latin, and it comes from the Anglo-Saxon. We get about 83% of our words from the Oxford Dictionary that are in English are up here. The reason why it seems so irregular, because all the common everyday words are what you learn in first, second, and third grade, the ones that are not phonetic, your dolch words, your sight words, the ones that you just have to memorize, you can't sound out. Those are the most common words that we use. I, 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 it's something like it's, um, they only make up like 10% of the English language, but we use them like 70% of the time. Don't quote me exactly on that, but it's something like that. And that's why English seems so much more irregular than what it is. Okay. You guys did a good job on that. <laughs> Let's go ahead, if you want to take a look at your next page, let's go over the definition of dyslexia. Again, it is not a, a catch-all term. You can find lots of different definitions for it. So what I, the question I like to ask is, yeah, where did the definition come from? A lot of people define it as a reading disability and as different things. Where did the definition come from? Are you going to take it from um, a research group and people who are studying it for years and years and years, like the National Institutes of Health? Or are you going to take it from, I think um, they quoted someone from Every Man's Dictionary. You know, go where the evidence is, where the scientific proof is, and who's doing scientific research to help these kids. Go with their definition. They're, they're, that's the most worthwhile place that you can get your definition from. Now, this definition that I'm sharing with you was just uh, adopted in 2003. It was made um, by the International Dyslexia Association in collaboration with the National Institutes of Health and the National Institute of Child Health and Development. All your leading reading research comes from these places. So let's take a look at what, what it is. Number one on your sheet. Dyslexia is a specific learning disability that is neurological in origin. Okay, it's a wiring glitch. As when you're being formed, there's a wiring glitch, and it's a neurologically based problem. If you look at brain scans, you can see the difference in these kids' brains as compared with someone who is non-dyslexic. Here, um, the second sentence, it is a language-based disorder. Once again, it is not a reading disability. It is a language-based disorder, which is why it affects writing and even more so spelling. It's, characters by, it's characterized by difficulties with accurate and fluent word recognition. These kids, a lot of them, not all of them, a lot of them have a difficult time with fluency. Which is harder to remediate, accuracy or fluency? Any ideas? Which one's harder to remediate, a kid's accuracy with reading or their fluency? Fluency. fluency. Because fluency is an innate skill. Um, decoding is actually, if you know the right tools, that's much easier to, to work with uh, than fluency deficits are. Um, poor spelling, you might want to circle that on here in that last line under number one. Poor spelling, that's your biggest telltale sign, is your spelling. And decoding abilities. We use a lot of nonsense words. Um, and you're going to see on some slides later why, you know, and, and it's criticized by a lot of people, why would you have a child read nonsense words when there's no meaning behind the words? Why are you having them do it? Why are we having them, why do you think that is? Why would we give them a list of nonsense words? Because they still follow our rules. Exactly, they still follow the word rules. Also, they can't go back to their visual memory because they've never seen it before. Are they decoding the word accurately? Do they know if the vowel is long? Do they know if it's short? Do they know if it's schwa? Do they know if it's a diphthong? Do they know where the accent goes? All that kind of stuff. Um, if someone, I always have a hard time when someone comes up to me and says, what is dyslexia? Because it's like, well, do you have about 45 minutes, you know, to get through the definition? I wanted to share with you just what I, what I tell people if I only have about five seconds what it is. 
And this was a term by a physician in Germany. Um, his name was Henschelwood, Dr. Henschelwood. He was a forerunner. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the Orton Gillingham program, but he's a forerunner of Dr. Orton, who then termed you or coined the term dyslexia. But he said oops, that this is what dyslexia is. And to, out of everything I've ever heard it, very quickly and concisely. I think this tells it the best. Word blindness. Because they can see a word. How many of you have used index cards with words written on? You go over them. Sometimes as kids, they can really get them. And then they see it in a book someplace else, that same word that they've mastered on the index cards. They have no idea what it is. None. Spelling, again, we go back to the word like should or where or were, or just one of those, even a simpler word that you would expect a first, second grader to know. And, you know, they're in fifth grade, and they spell it four different times on one sheet of paper. Each time it's spelled four different ways. Because it's the word blindness, they're missing this glitch in their wiring is an orthographic, is it an orthographic memory deficit. And they cannot remember how, what the word looks like for reading or for spelling. Yes, and you had a question. Could you write down the name of that German doctor, Henschel? Yes. His name, he was in the 1860s. His name was Dr. I think I'm spelling that correctly. And he was the, he was the first person who ever went on and said, you know, there's something different about these kids. Um, because they're smart, but they're not reading. He's the first one who caught on to that. Because before this time, everyone who couldn't read was put into standards class or into the mentally impaired class. He said, but wait, these are smart kids. Wait, he comes up with some of the greatest stories I've ever heard when he talks to me and has a great, you know, whatever. He is smart. Um, he was the front runner then to Dr. Dr. Orton, Dr. Samuel Orton. He picked up Dr. Henschelwood's work and um, continued. Um, and he was back in the 1920s. Okay, any questions? Okay, going on with number two, we're still going to look at our definition. So far, we've learned that it's a language-based disorder, and it's characterized by problems in word recognition and fluency. Okay, that's pretty straightforward so far. Number two, these difficulties typically result from a deficit in the phonological component of language. Um, that the phonological component that deals with some things that we don't want to get into just for time's sake here, but again, it, it's a language disability and it's a deficit at the phonological processing part of language. That's your phonemic awareness, which I just mentioned real briefly. It's your verbal short-term memory. It's your rapid automatized naming speed. Um, real interesting, um, you can actually predict someone's fluency to, a, to some degree. Um, in that, um, if I gave the Torgerson, he has the comprehensive test of uh, phonological processing, I can show you a book. How fast is your processing speed? I'm going to flip over the page. There might be yellow, blue, red, green, and you have to say those as fast as you can, and there might be 60 of them on there. I stop the stopwatch. Uh, when you stop, or after, you're given about... I don't remember offhand, 30 seconds. How many can you do in 30 seconds? Um, then it's nationally normed um, through longitudinal studies and everything like that. Um, and how fast you can get, get the idea up, spit it out, that's going to have, that's going to some way correlate with your reading. Some kids will never be fast readers. No matter how long you work with their fluency, they will never be. Now, that doesn't mean you can't improve upon where they are and that you can't increase where they are. Absolutely you can. Um, I was taught, um, I got my training at uh, Massachusetts General Hospital, and I was taught, and this made more sense to me, it's, it's kind of like your metabolism. You know, there are things you can do to increase it as much as you can. You know, I'm going to walk every morning, I'm going to eat breakfast, I'm not going to eat after... 5 p.m., um, cut out sweets. There's, lots, there's things I can do to maximize it. But you know what? I'm never going to be like that girl over there who eats donuts all day and she weighs like 
90 pounds, you know, I'm not going to be able to completely switch. So there are things I can do to maximize what I have, but some of that is an innate processing skill, and it's um, and it is um, called rapid automatized naming. How fast is your processing? Um, that's why fluency is harder to remediate than accuracy, because part of that is just it's innate. Now, if, if, if you're not fluent because you're not decoding, well, then that's another different story. Okay. Um, continuing with the definition, it is often unexpected in relation to other cognitive, cognitive abilities. What that means, your cognitive ability, what are they referring to there when they say cognitive ability? They're referring to your IQ. So your cognitive ability, you know, once again, it might be up here in the higher range at the 120, but yet you're reading down here. Okay, so those two do not match up. So that's what it means that it is unexpected in relation to your cognitive abilities. Say, wow, this lady right here, man, she is smart. She can design buildings and do all these great things, has great mental rotation skills. She is smart. And then I look at her reading score and I say, oh, but her reading score, well, I'm surprised that it's that low because she is so smart. Um, and that could be a good sign of dyslexia there. Um, also, some of these kids, it's not that they have bad school teachers. You're like, some parents are like, yeah, well, maybe next year when they get, you know, Mrs. whomever, my kid will do better. If it's a true reading disability, if it's a truly dyslexia and the language disability, it doesn't matter. They need something more specific than what a classroom teacher can generally give, especially in a class of 30. Um, number three, secondary consequences um, include reading comprehension. Notice reading comprehension is not a symptom of dyslexia. It's an indirect symptom of dyslexia. If I have problems with decoding and fluency, my comprehension is going to be hampered. Um, but it is not a true um, comprehension issue. It's something that's referred to as hyperlexia. And a very few, that's much more rare. Um, dyslexia is problems at the single word decoding level and at the fluency level. That's where the breakdown is. Now, I might be working so hard to get those words out accurately and quickly that I'm using up all my mental energy that I have no clue what I just read. But again, that is not a true comprehension problem. That's because the breakdown is in the decoding and the fluency. Um, and then it also says, uh, reduced reading experience can impede growth of vocabulary, as we all know, and background knowledge. Uh, IQ testing is very controversial in the world of dyslexia because they say, yes, but if you're dyslexic, especially as an adult, your IQ test is going to go down, your cultural literacy goes down, all the wealth of knowledge around you that people pick up otherwise and you miss out on if you're not reading, you know, so it will affect your IQ score. So that's one thing to, to keep in mind also. Okay, so that's technically what dyslexia is, but what does it look like? Someone hands you something, and you're like, boy, this doesn't look quite right. Let's just, I'm going to give you a couple samples of some work that I've got from students. If you want to look at the bottom part, the one with the grocery bag on top here, this was done by a girl at the end of first grade. What do you notice about what you see? Do you see anything that maybe should send off um, a red flag or a, a couple signals going, ooh, I might want to watch her a little bit more closely? Yes? She spelled everything wrong except for the words she copied off the bag. Mm -hmm. uh, not everything. Uh -huh. But she copied those words which were long and got them letter perfect. But there's a lot of misspelled words. Okay, again, what's your number one telltale sign of dyslexia? Spelling. Spelling. Um, notice um, she also, or anything else, let me go to you guys first. Do you notice anything else about that? Yes. Spelling phonetically what she hears. She's, she's learned, she's had phonics. This girl knows her phonics. She hears the word says, she goes S, 
S-E-S. Very good. She's had her phonics. She had a great phonics teacher. Okay. Um, she's spelling phonetically. Um, very good. Anything else? Yes. W's and M. Notice under where the, with the grocery bag where it says asking, she meant to put why is there a picture of a bag, and she put her M's and W's are turned upside down. We usually think B's and D's, but it's also N's and U's. It's also M's and W's. All dyslexics do not do that. At the Learning Center, probably only about 25% of the kids diagnosed with dyslexia reversed, um, reversed B's and D's and P's and Q's in that. Um, also, notice she has a wrong, she has the wrong, uh, where was it? She's, remember we said it was a language disability? She has the wrong word. She says the back says. What does she mean to say? Yeah. The bag says. She's getting her words mixed up. Again, it's a language disability. Then um, my, which she means why, is there a picture, spelled phonetically, of a back? Again, now she's at the end of first grade. She should know the difference between a back and a bag. Of course she does. But in writing, then, she's getting it all mixed up. Um, at the bottom, um, see if there's anything else to hit with the, the guitar man. Again, her M and W's are, are flipped upside down. So it's, um, also, I don't know if you can notice, where under the asking where it says, why does, she has her B's and D's mixed up. So this is a girl who does mix up her letters. Um, you know, she spells because in here, and it's different throughout <laughs> here. So that's what it might look like for, for a girl who is in first, that she was at the end of first grade. What was that? She's consistently wrong the way she spells because. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And sometimes they could spell because six different ways, and it's different each time. We're going to look at, on the next page, um, this man, um, he was 27 years old, and he used the word problem, I think, three times in, like, the first four lines. Every time he went to spell problem, it was different. Why? Because of this word blindness. And actually, one of the times he wrote the word problem, he had it right. So one of the times it's right. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. It's, it's this sheet. Okay, why don't we read this out together. Let's see how well you guys can muddle your way through this. It's, this is a 27-year-old. Can anyone tell me what the title is? The Inconvenience. The Inconvenience. My name is blank, and I have a problem reading and spelling. It, it, uh, right. And notice his B and D reversals. Now he's using the word problem, and it is spelled correctly. Since, you know, it's phonetic. Um, it's been a problem since I was in third grade. Now notice, again, it's a language disability. The next word should be and, and he, he knows how to spell and, I'm sure, but he just spells an, you know? Again, it's, it's that language and that it's giving him difficulty. And, I was able to graduate. He should have a period there. That's the end of his thought. Notice a lot of this is missing any kind of punctuation whatsoever. Um, I was able to graduate. Okay, reading was always hard, and I wanted to go for more schooling. It was a problem. Okay, so good. I'm going to stop you there for a second. Notice also in that part that was just read when. This is a 27 year old man. Um, again, how many times has he seen the word when? Thousands? Out, you know, um, and he was actually diagnosed and he had an IQ test and he was above average IQ. Again, but well, why is that? It's the word blindness. Um, now, the next one, he spells so, I thought this was interesting S O W E. So, for, he has the number four, so for in order to solve my shortcoming, I quit my job and have token another that demand less time and have spent the time finding a good tutor and working at learning a new way to read. And in one year, I hope to go to college and work on my degree. 
what I have learned so far, uh, notice up above he spelled so S-O-W-E, now he's spelling it S-O-W, I believe that is. So, um, so far is a new way to look at word, and it is working, and he put wording. <laughs> I'm not kidding myself. I have a long way to go, but I am, um, I am better, and I, and I, he should have put in there, I have no intention of quitting. <laughs> okay? So this is a very motivated, bright person. And this is also, you know, d dyslexia is on a spectrum. You know, can you be a little bit dyslexic? Yes, you can be a little bit dyslexic. Um, or you can be very dyslexic. Um, so it's all on a continuum. So some kids are like, well, they show some, a few symptoms. You know, it might be hindering them a little bit. You know, and then you have other kids where you're like, oh, my goodness, you know, this poor child. So. Okay. A lady up here was holding up a, a note that says remediation, question mark. This is what we really all want to know. Well, I suspect that someone I know or someone I work with has dyslexia. What do I do about it? Okay? Um, it's not an easy thing to answer either. Um, but we're going to take a shot and see, see what we can get. Um, there are many different programs out there. So um, I'm coming from an Orton-Gillingham background, but there are many programs out there that can work for a dyslexic child. Um, these, yes? How about for dyslexic adults? Yeah. Absolutely. And dyslexic. I, I used to work with, I work with children, so I say children. Can it be used with adults? Absolutely it can be. Absolutely. You said that it has to start at, the, the, the early age. Should start at an early age, otherwise... Well, ideally. No, no, ideally. Um, they, the research shows that if you wait until after the age of 12, you're going to put in four times the amount of work, four times the amount of money, four times the, long, the length of time to remediate. You have to undo everything that they've learned and all the compensations they've learned. So you have to undo a lot. So early intervention is important to help them the fastest. It's never too late. I had, I, I didn't bring it, um, a lady in Ecuador was 99 and she was taking reading lessons. You know, never too late. Never. Ideally, you want to catch them early. Okay, so what should a program entail if you're going to work with someone who you think might have dyslexia? And dyslexia is a subjective term. So you might say, oh, that child has dyslexia, or that adult has dyslexia, and you might take a look at them and say, no, I don't think they do. So when I get papers of testing and they say, no, I don't find that this child has dyslexia, I take it with a grain of salt. I don't, you know, one person says they do, one person says they don't. I'll just work with them and see, get my own opinion, okay? Um, but these are the different things. You have six things on your outline that you want in a program. The first one, make learning multisensory. We're going to go through um, some of these rather quickly. Um, you want to utilize your auditory, visual, and tactile kinesthetic learning pathways simultaneously. Um, a lot of the research is coming out now is showing the importance of tactile kinesthetic pathway to learning and how strong it is for some of these kids. A lot of these kids are weak up here in the visual, and so a lot of them are weak in the auditory. A lot of these kids have problems with auditory discrimination um, also. And so they get a lot out of using tactile kinesthetic. So whenever they do something, a lot of times you, um, you'd see like a sand tray or something, and they would trace in the sand as they're looking at it, as they're saying it, A says A, ah, A says A, ah, A says A. Ah. But you want to get that feeling. Now, I'm a very visual learner. Doing tactile kinesthetic doesn't do that much for me with the sand tray. But for some of these kids, when you have weaker pathways here and here, some of these kids are very tactile kinesthetic, and you want to go to that third that third pathway to learning. And it's important you do them all simultaneously. Yes? I was helping my uh, niece with the alphabet, and she liked it if I would trace the letters on her stomach and on her back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. 
absolutely. That, and that's, yes, that's a perfect example. Thank you. <laughs> Using these senses simultaneously facilitates the student's ability to learn and recall information. Okay, so that's number one. We kind of went through that one quickly, but there's some other ones I want to hit on more. Uh, the second one on your outline, the second thing that your program you want to look for, it needs to be explicit. The research texts, all of them, explicit, explicit, explicit. You know, years ago, actually it started in California, you know, the whole language program, have the kid discover, you know, on their own in whole language. Here, you tell the kids. You don't let them guess. You don't let them infer it. They have a disability. We're short on time. You know, we want to get them up reading um, as quickly as we can. You tell them what it is. You leave nothing for, their, for chance for them to figure out. You tell them, this is a B, it says B, or whatever you might be doing. This is this rule we're doing today, and this is when you use it. You use CK at the end of a one-syllable word, but it immediately follows a short vowel. Um, or whatever, so explicit, you tell them. Um, systematic, this is real important too. When we said earlier that phonics is not, um, it is necessary, but it's not sufficient. Again, we want to see explicit phonics, and we want to see systematic. Most things are like, oh, well, you know what? Today we'll do, oh, oh, ooh, uh, you know, um, and it's kind of a grab bag approach. Now, think of it as the same way as math. Well, before you learn to multiply and divide, you have to know how to add and subtract. Before you can do the, I don't know, Pythagorean theorem, you need to know how to multiply and divide. You know, it's, it's just common sense. They build on each other. Well, this is taught in the same way. The sequence must begin with the easiest and most basic elements of the English language and progress methodically to more difficult material. Each step is based on material already learned. Let's take a look at what that looks like. I'll come back to that in a second. This is just an example of an order of introduction that I might do with a child or an adult. Um, I'd introduce, I'd see which one's up under number one, which ones they don't know, and then I introduce them, one or two at a time, very slowly, not all at once. And then it, once they know those, okay, then I'm gonna go on to these finish up the alphabet. And these are all done for a very specific reason. My B and D are separated. You know, the two short vowels that are the most complicated for kids are I and E, the I, E. And so those are divided up. Um, so they're very specific reasons. Also the C and the G are the hard sounds because those are the most common in the English language. They don't learn C as until much later. Um, also then, after they knew all of these, and all of these, then I'm going to go on to the digraphs. Explain what a digraph is. Two letters, one sound. Very good. Two letters, one sound. Thank you. <laughs> um, and I'm going to give them a word list to read. And it might look like this. And I'm only using, let's say they finish, they know all of number one, all of number two, and all of number three. I'm going to have my word list here for them to read. Um, why don't, at this point in my lesson plan, I'm not giving them a story. What is the point of not giving them a story? Well, they could be at that level. They could read a story, but right now, first, I'm going to have them practice with just a word list, and people are like, what's the point of that? There is a point. What do you think it might be? I think it might be because in the story, they could guess at what the next word is going to be, but this is a list of words, and most of them are nonsense, except for English. Well, actually, yeah, yeah, the first one, this is, these are real, and then you have, I added some nonsense, but you're exactly right. Why do you give them uh, just regular words? You've taken out all the context clues. You know, if you're talking about a farm and the next word starts with a P, well, guess what? I'll probably say pig, and I'll probably be right, whether I know how to decode that word or not. Here, you know what, you know what they're doing. Um, I know it's a close, these are all closed syllables, so that means all my vowels will be short. There are no long vowels in here. Let's conquer the short vowels before we do anything else. So once they know all these, 
Then I'm going to do my long, uh, my silent E syllables. You know, when I go from hop to hope with that silent E at the end, it makes my O long. So same with uh, map or mat to mate. It changes the vowel sound. So I'm not talking about any kind of long vowels, only the ones that are made long by the silent E at the end I'm going to introduce at this time. And then to my word list, I might also then add words like code and nonsense word vome. So these are all short, and now I'm getting long, and I'd mix these all up in there to make sure that they're applying the rules. Are you applying the rule that that E makes that vowel long? Yes. Lens. That's coming up. Well, I'm just, that was what I was questioning. Why the order? Why the lens are not in, in after number two? Why well, do have, why do you have digraphs? Here they are. You know what? And there's nothing magic about this order of introduction. This isn't like, you have to do it this way. No, I've seen, this is one example. There are things you want to, overall, you want to follow the concept from the easiest and most basic to the least common in the English language. Okay, so by the time, this is the very beginning, but by the time we're done with the student, you know, now you're getting into Latin and Greek word parts. This says eus. This says eit, you know, um, um, shul and T-I-A-L, you know, um, you're getting into word parts. So we're starting here, but our goal is to get there and with your morphemes. Um, but now I'm going to hit just what um, that lady mentioned, your blends. Blends are your two letters that go together, but just um, you say them almost as one quick sound, even though they're two distinct sounds. Bull, spra, nd. Inch. They can be beginning and ending. You introduce those very slowly. I'd start only with the beginning blends and only blends that have two letters. Then I might do the beginning blends with the ones with three letters. Okay, so now when I'm here, I have a beginning blend, close. Actually, I would not use this word because S says Z and I've not taught S says Z. Okay, S can say Z when it's between two vowels like in hose, nose, compose. Um, so actually, this would be a mistake on my lesson plan because we have not taught that. Um, I don't want to give the kid anything that I have not specifically taught them yet. Okay, swish. Well, here I have um, a digraph and a beginning blend. Here I have an ending blend. Here I have a beginning blend and a silent E. Are they able to make the vowel changes as we go along? Um, and you can tell, now we are here, and we're only on number five. And you can, can you see the how it's getting more difficult? Very slowly, though. We're going very slowly. I might introduce only a couple of these at a time. OK? Um, but it's building, just like math builds, just like science builds. Um, same thing. And then they get to nonsense words. Shrent. I have a beginning blend and an ending blend there. I know my vowel has to be short because it's a closed syllable, so on and so forth. OK. Um, the next thing now, so far, if we go back here, my word lists, they only have monosyllabic words. Okay, they're only one syllable. I have not given my student one two-syllable word yet. Let's get one syllable down first before we look at any two-syllable word. Because most of the kids are like, boy, I can't do that. It looks so scary. You know, it's so long. Um, and, you know, there's a real easy way. Now, for the very first time, after they've mastered all of that on the previous page. Now I'm going to give them multi-syllable words. Napkin. Um, there's a syllable division that you use. You know that you divide the word then right here. You have to, um, so then I cover this up. I know my A is short because it's a closed syllable. Nap. I know my I is short, so it's k, i, n, kin, napkin. You know, for the very first time, I'm introducing them, and I'm giving them a very specific way how to break apart the word. It's not just, here, read this multi-syllable word. It's if they're like, gosh, I don't know what that says. Well, um, you know, there, you have your vowel, your vowel, and your consonant, your consonant. And according to the pattern, you divide between your consonants. So now I gave them, now if a kid is reading a word list, and they come to this, and they go, um, you know what I say to them? Divide. And they know what to do, and they do their little marks, and then they do it, and then they say, oh, napkin. Perfect. Tonsil, same thing. They know where to divide if you follow that syllable division. I know both of my vowels are short. Reptile, in here, then I, I know that I would divide right here. 
I know my I has to be long because it's a silent E syllable. My E is making my I long. I read one syllable at a time, reptile. And you can use three syllable words, fantastic. Wisconsin, those are all closed syllables um, that you can use a syllable division with. Some of these kids get really excited because some of these kids have never read a two syllable word before. So um, now I'm making it a little bit harder. The lady back there asked about blends before. Well, now I'm going to add blends in my multisyllable words. So now I recognize my mp as a blend. I divide it here. I know that both of those are short because they're closed syllables. I have pump and kin. I know I'm going through this quickly, just for normally I do this. Um, I did it through UC Irvine and UC Riverside in a 40 hour lecture. So um, I'm trying to go fast. And then lobster. Um, but it's, it's building. Now we're doing multi-syllable words with blends. Uh, this, is, this isn't the one I use, but this is the, the systematic introduction that, um, that is used, that someone used. They start with the single consonants, they hit the short vowels, they hit the syllable division, the digraphs. Um, here, in consonant blends, they did them here. They did a spelling rule. Here's where they teach S as saying Z. Now they're hitting the major vowel teams. It's all very systematic and slow. And this is the next page. Now they're hitting your R control, your TCH. When do you use TCH or when do you use CH for ch? Well, you use TCH at the end of a one syllable word when it immediately follows a short vowel. You have your um, R controls. Here she's teaching schwa with the U and I. I wouldn't teach it there, but this is what they're, you know, there's different orders of introduction. <laughs> the three sounds of ED for past tense id, d, t. Um, soft G, you know, when does C say k? When does it say s? Same with the G. Um, you know, we're getting into a few of the beginning suffixes, li, um, e, i, g, h. See, we're, see how we're moving from the most basic and we're starting to get a little bit less common? And so on and so forth. Now we're hitting your diphthongs, um, your more complicated R control, your more complicated suffix, your shun and your jun. Um, you guys see, though, how it's moving from the most, the most simple and basic to the more complicated? OK. So let me. So this is what we mean by systematic. Building from the easiest parts of the English language and the most consistent to the less consistent. Also, by cumulative, we just mean once a skill is taught, it is never dropped. So you, you teach until they hit mastery. You don't go on. Who, sets the, who should set the pace in a tutoring session? <laughs> the student. Very good. You all get A's. The student, if they haven't mastered it, you shouldn't go on because it's going to fall apart. When they add more and more information on there, it's going to fall apart. Uh, so you never want to drop it. Um, one of the... Le one of the biggest mistakes that um, beginning tutors make um, that I have found is they go too fast um, and, and they need to slow it down. Okay, let me find, let me get our slide back up here. Okay, number three, ideally, now I know this is impossible with our school systems and library and funding. Ideally, though, this is what they say the remediation should be. It should be one-on-one. -on -one. It's diagnostic and prescriptive. And in order to diagnose where, because if, if you already know um, some of those beginning things, I'm not going to touch them. You already know them. But I'm going to fill in the holes and then build on there. And so it's very individualized. Uh, that's why Linda Mood Bell is one-on-one. -on -one. That's why Orson Gillingham is one-on-one. -on -one. Can you do it in small groups? Yes. Have I done it in small groups? Yes. Is it harder? Well, yes. <laughs> but it, it can be done, and it is done. Um, but they say ideally, one on, ideally in an ideal world. <laughs> and your uh, individualized teaching, careful and continuous assessment. And where their holes are, that's where you're going to fill. Or teach if they don't know something. And you're building. Number four, um, it's cognitive. 
Um, when I ran uh, the Learning Center, we did have a minimum IQ requirement, which is a little bit controversial, and I, I, I understand why, and I agree that it, uh, it's a sticky point. Uh, why did we do that? For two reasons. One, because in order to be diagnosed as dyslexic, you have to have a minimum of an average IQ. Because otherwise, folks, if you get much below that 90 IQ, which is your lower side of average, it's no longer dyslexia, but then it's just your slower learner or your you know, slower mental capacity. Okay, so then it's something else. And also, some of these programs are tough. I mean, there's a lot to know. There's a lot of, you know, in order to know the 87 percent of the words that are phonetic, there's a lot of rules and you need to get to them quickly and um, efficiently. So it needs to be based on logic and re reasoning. Now at school, spelling is taught as a memorization skill. Okay, we know, guess what guys? These kids can't memorize these spelling lists. Some of them can and they get 100 on Friday's test, but then next week they go to spell the same word that they just got 100 on from the last week's spelling test and they go to write it and it's completely wrong. And you're like, but you just had it. Um, we need to teach these students how because they cannot memorize them. That's why that 27 year old was still spelling when, W-E-N. Um, you need to teach it as a thinking skill. Now, this I got from a spelling book. Um, and this is, they'd say, it's phonetic. We're using a phonics based spelling program we're using all the oo sounds, but what is wrong with that spelling? Well, what is less desirable about this spelling? Coming from the, um, the thought of a dyslexic student. There's so many variations on it. Yeah. If you go through, I won't take the time to do, in this spelling list of 21 words, there are nine different ways to spell oo. What are you telling them to do? Memorize. Which one is spelled with an E-W, which one with an O-O? You're just telling them to memorize. Okay, it's not going to help them. But yet, teachers say, oh, but we do teach phonetically. Ugh, but for your dyslexic student, ooh, it's going to be hard. Some of these other programs, they do things. Um, how, and this is done over a course of time. But how do you spell A? Um, let's say I'm writing a story, and I want to spell the word. I forgot what word I picked here. Um, I want to spell the word state, and I know it's st, s t a. Well, but I don't know how to spell that a part. Well, I can go. Okay, what are there are eight ways to spell a? There's a, a dash e, a i, a y, um, e i, e i g h, e y. And E A. Is that one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight? Okay, so I'd go here. Well, I want to spell the word state. I know it's not this one because E A only says A in four words in the English language. Yay, great, break, and stake. I know it can't be that one. I know it can't be E Y um, because this is also very uncommon and it only comes at the end of a word like obey, pray, uh, the kind of food pray, um, survey. So I know it can't be that. I know E-I-G-H doesn't say A because E-I-G-H you only use in, um, wait, or, um, there's a jingle and now I'm blanking out on it. My eight, my, wait, my eight, oh man, my, wait, my eight neighbors weigh as much as a freight as slaves. Okay, or if it's, so if it's in that, or a variation of the words, like way, if it's, or my eight, 18, or 80, um, whatever, but if it's in one of those words, then it's going to be E-I-G-H. It's not E-I as in rain or um, chow mein, M-E-I-N, because you only use this in the middle of a word if it ends in an N or a G-N. It's the only time. Now I'm going to go up here. This is separating, this line is separating my common spellings from my uncommon. Now I go here, A-Y is common, but I want the word state. I hear sound after the A sound, so in this I can only use at the end. AI, could it be AI? It could be AI. Could it be A consonant E? It could be, I'm going to write those down because both of those will work. Could it be just A? No, because it can only say A at the end of an open syllable and I don't have an open syllable here, um, so I know it can't be this one. Um, and now. 
gosh, and now you know what I say to the, the student? Which one looks better? You, because they both say state. Which one looks better? And uh, eight out of 10 times, <laughs> they'll go, this one, great, how did you know that? I don't know, it just, it, it looked better. Hey, great, I'll take it, you know? Um, so when we say it's cognitive, Boy, there's a lot to learn because you have to. You can't stop and do this for every word you're at. You know, there's nine ways to spell e. There's nine ways to spell shun. You can't stop for everything. But that's also why you need to teach it to a mastery level, so that when you get to something, you go. You, it's not taxing your mind to get um, to the spelling or the reading. So you also want a cognitive approach. Don't find something that just teaches them how to memorize, because that will bring failure for the dyslexic child, or it won't bring you the, the results that you want. We've already touched on this. It's taught to automaticity. Um, again, this is ideally. I'm usually happy if I get my <coughs> students to mastery. Um, but these are the different levels of learning. You want to get them, you know, what is your name? Boom. That's how you want to get it. When do you use that rule? Boom. That when do you use that? Boom that they need to know it. When I show them the letter, whoops, when I show them the letter Y, and I hold up the card that says Y, I say, okay, well, what does Y say? They need to say, ya, e, i, i, good. When does Y say ya? When it's a consonant, good. When does Y say e? At the end of a multi-syllable word, good. When does Y say i? At the end of an open syllable, like a cyclone, good. When does it say i? In words of Greek and Latin, you know, boom. So they know which ones to grab, okay? Um, lastly, last thing you want to look for in your program, and this is so important, these, especially with most of you, most of you working with adults, man, these, these poor people, I don't know how they made it through, um, their confidence is out the window. None. And for them to even come and sign up to get help, I applaud them greatly because I don't think I would be able to do it. You have to make sure that you're setting them up for success. Um, how do you do it? Well, this program will say, confidence in one's ability cannot be developed if trying brings about failure too often. If they are failing during the tutoring lesson plan, what's going to happen? They're going to get discouraged. They're going to get frustrated. They might drop out. You want to prevent frustration as much as possible. Um, you want it to be all success orientated. How do we do that? Well, we do isolated reading and spelling. Remember on that order of introduction that you saw earlier? Um, if, they have, if I have not introduced any of the major vowel teams, I'm not going to give them a story that have any vowel teams in them. Okay, does that make sense? I will only give them to read the stories. Now I'm doing stories. Before I just had a word list. Now I'm doing stories. And I'm only giving them um, what I have directly taught them. So if they get to that multi-syllable word, if the word is silo or something, and they're coming across it and they don't know what that word is, I say divide. They divide it. They know they have an open syllable. They know that vowel is long, si, and low. And you say, very good. And the tutor actually says very little. You put it all back on them. Okay, and, you know, well, how did you know that the I is long? How did you know the O was long? You know, and you, let, you bring them to discover that or to, to go through it. You let them do the thinking. Um, now there is, what's one of the criticisms, the big criticisms, especially from whole language components um, on doing isolated reading and spelling? What's the biggest criticism? Comprehension. That's part of it. Absolutely, comprehension. Um, and, and I'm going to bring that up in a second after. Let me. T well, this is what this is. Book one. This is an Orton Gillingham type um, program um, called Wilson. Um, well, you have pretty dumb stories. If I can only use. Six letters of the alphabet. I have started with a child. Um, we started with only three letters, and we chose his initials. And those were the three letters we started with. Well, then we got to six, but I could only give him stories then that included those six letters in it, because I'm not going to give him anything that's going to have him fail. Okay? But then as the criticism to that, Kim and Bob got a big job. 
Okay, you're going back to, you know what, but they can read it with 100% accuracy. For adults, they have um, adult books for the adult learners, so the, it's still controlled, but the vocabulary is a little bit harder. But sometimes the sentences, you read the story and you're like, that was kind of a weird story. Um, but after you do, you know, um, this is after you introduce silent E's. And now the story, again, no vowel teams, no diphthongs, no three-syllable words if I haven't taught them yet, no multi-syllable words with blends if I haven't taught that yet, but a fine time on the slope. See how it's doing your silent E's there? But I'm giving them nothing to read that I have not specifically taught them because you want them to be able to do this um, with, with it, it, if you're giving them a wordless or story and they're struggling too much to get through and it's bringing frustration, then you need to back down um, and give them some back off. Either that, that should tell you that you're either going too fast as a tutor or you need to just back down a couple of and just review. If you have to review for a month, great, because you want to get them up to an automaticity or mastery level before you go on. Also, you want to build up their confidence. One of the biggest motivators, have them read a story, they'll want to read another one. <laughs> so, um, and then also, it's going to build up um, their fluency. Um, okay, th this, what I want to sh show you next this is not a comprehensive list, so don't say, you know, there are other programs out there. These are some of the bigger nationally known programs that are specifically out there to deal with dyslexics. Do these programs work with kids who are just behind in reading and not dyslexic? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, these are some of what the programs are. Um, most of them, interesting enough, are in New England. <laughs> um, but you have your Orton Gillingham, you have your Linda Mood Bell, who's out of San Luis Obispo. Have, have, are any of you familiar with Linda Mood Bell, or speech language people? Um, Slingerland, I believe, is made for the classroom for small groups, the Slingerland program. Wilson, I, I use Wilson a, a lot. Um, she's out of Massachusetts. Spalding, the Sunday system is out of Minnesota. And Susan Barton, she's actually here in California. Um, has anyone heard of Bright Solutions? It's an Orton Gillingham based program catered for parents and tutors who don't have extensive, you know, years and years of background um, training and the foundations of reading and everything like that. So they can teach in a systematic, explicit, direct way, in a success oriented way, but without all the, the training. And she's, she's somewhere here in California. Um, <laughs> I can't think of where, but she, and she um, has videos that you can, I don't know, that you can watch and see if you like her stuff. I've never used her stuff, but I've just become familiar with her. Um, but that's another one. Okay. Um, we have about a minute and a half left. So, um, diagnostic considerations. Why, sh do you need to get diagnosed? Do you have to have that as a, um, as something? Absolutely not. Um, the only reason I think that you're really benefited in getting a diagnosis is that um, it was Mel Levine who said a thorough, um, a thorough, um, a thorough diagnosis or a thorough diagnosis leads to an accurate prescription. The more you know what specifically is wrong or what's going on, a lot of these learning disabilities they intermesh. Well, how I teach, how I treat a short-term memory problem. It's going to be much different than how I work with a dyslexic kid or ADHD, and some of them have multiple. So the more specifically I can find out what's going on in this child, what their specific strengths and weaknesses are, then the more accurately I can get, get the solution and get, get them help um, and, and get them right where they need to be because different learning disabilities will take on different forms of help and remediation. So um, are there any questions? <laughs> Where do you recommend to have the testing? The question was, where would you recommend for the testing? Um, neuropsychologists can do it. Um, school psychologists do not diagnose with dyslexia. Um, there are very few states whose school systems do. Texas is one of them. 
Um, but Texas also has one of the highest reading scores, which I find interesting. I don't know if there's a correlation there or not for sure. Um, also, if you go on the website to the International Dyslexia Association, um, you go under resources and then you go to um, what um, you, you put in your zip code and it will tell you who in your area. It'll tell you if they're an educational therapist, it'll tell you if they're a tester or what their qualifications are and who they are and their phone number. And that's another way that you can find them. But it can be a little bit tricky. Dyslexia is a subjective diagnosis. Um, it's also an exclusionary diagnosis, which means, well, if it's not this, and it's not this, and it's not a brain injury, and it's not a low IQ, well, then it must be this. Okay, it's not an exact science, and it is subjective. Yes? Does dyslexia uh, tie in with autism at all? Those are actually two separate, two separate issues. Now, can they have both? Probably, yes. Um, but yeah, they're two separate. They're not on the same. They're on, not under the same umbrella. Right, but no. Okay, what you said. When you have one, you could have the other. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Anything else? Yes. Well, I have a comment about the Orton Gillingham and the Wilson, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. But the Orton Gillingham is like an intense, like a year kind of training, and the um, I did take. The Wilson, I took like a three day, and it seems like a more accessible kind of program, but it's got a lot of the same things that the uh, Orton Gillingham has, and, and, and it has what you were uh, doing, I think, which is giving us the rules, which is a big, important part, I think. And uh, I stumbled on a, on a website, and I don't remember what it was, and I was able to download Orton Gillingham worksheets, like 50 or 100 of oh, them, wow. for free. Wow. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I'll have to look for and, those online. And, you know, it had all those rules, which are so great. And you know what? This, they're not in the spelling books at school. I think in school, in the spelling book, you have I before E except after C. And that, I, I don't know if there's too many more. There, there's, there's 100 of them. Um, and you can, your spelling can become 87% accurate. Remember we said 87% is predictable if you know those rules. Um, it, it's, a dyslexic spelling will never be mastered. Never be mastered. But their, their reading can be fully remediated and their spelling can get really close. We can bring them into the ballpark. We might not bring them to win the spelling bee ever, um, nor would we have that expectation, but we can, we can get them close, a lot closer. Now with spell checkers and the computers and everything, um, we, can, we can get them so they, you can read what they're writing. So, okay, I'm going to close it just because we're out of time, but thank you very much for all being here. So. <laughs>